The quality of mercy is not strained. It drops as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. The mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein does sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the heart of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power does then show like God's when mercy seasons justice. God is the author of all good things. So while this is not a scriptural passage, it is true that God's voice can be heard in words that are not specifically religious. Thus, these words. The quality of mercy is not strained. It drops from heaven. It is twice blessed to those that give the mercy and to those that receive the mercy. It is the mightiest of the virtues and is a better quality for the king to have than any other virtue. Awe and majesty are not as powerful as a tender mercy. For mercy resides in the heart as an attribute of God's own self. When we're merciful, we're most like God. When mercy seasons justice. I'm often struck by how the words of this poem echo the scriptures and play out in the daily events of life. When I hear stories of people terribly harmed by someone else's evil action, a murder, a rape, all manner of evil deeds done in darkness, I listen for what will be the consequences. Often those who survive speak of wanting justice. In no way do I make light of their searing pain or their tremendous loss. And surely justice is due. But sometimes what I hear in this request by the person aggrieved is that justice means revenge. I want revenge, the pound of flesh justice. I seldom hear God's justice being desired. And when I do hear mention of God's justice, that is, mercy seasoning justice, mercy is quaint, a novelty. It's not what you expect. You might remember the story of Charles Roberts. He burst into the West Nichols Mines Amish school, killing five girls aged between seven and 13. He injured another five before turning the gun on himself as police closed in. In the aftermath of that horrible tragedy, the widow of this man, Marie Roberts, thanked the Amish community for their love, their support. She said that she and her family were overwhelmed by the forgiveness the grace and the mercy shown to them following the murders of October 2nd. The Amish community said they forgave him and they've even helped set up a fund for the Roberts family at a local bank. Marie Roberts continues, your love for our family has helped to provide the healing we so desperately need. We are filled with sorrow for all of our Amish brothers, sisters, our neighbors whom we loved and continue to love. And we know there are many hard days ahead for all the families who have lost 
loved ones. And so we will continue to put our hope and trust in the God of all comfort as we seek to rebuild our lives. What an extraordinary grace there is in that story of God's mercy. Mercy justice. Mercy seasoning justice. In the many gospel parables devoted to mercy, Jesus reveals the nature of God as that of a father who never gives up until he has forgiven the wrong and overcome rejection with compassion and mercy. A father who never gives up. Those of you who are parents know well the extraordinary generosity that is sometimes needed with your children, and it means you will never give up on them. There are three parables in particular which speak of that grace. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the father and the two sons. In all three of these parables, the passion lies in the one who seeks out what or who is lost. Something or someone is missing. It's a sheep, a coin, two boys. The one who seeks will not stop seeking until this hole in the heart of the seeker is filled. Poignantly, the father of the two boys knows. He knows that both his sons have left him. He counters their great desertion with mercy. Why? Because mercy overcomes everything. Filling the heart with love and bringing consolation through pardon. Pope Francis is encouraging us to consider how faith and life intersect, looking at the very human emotions of anger, hatred, and revenge, and asks how a Christian can respond to these emotions in a way that set them apart from those who do not follow Christ. What could Christ teach us about making our way through the world with mercy, seasoning, justice? Francis lifts up another parable from the Gospel of Matthew. In reply to Peter's question about how many times should you forgive, Jesus says, I do not say seven times. I say 70 times, seven times. He then tells the story of the ruthless servant who called by his master to return a huge amount, begs the master for mercy. So, the master cancels the debt. But then, this man meets a fellow servant who owes him a few cents and who in turn begs on his knees for mercy. But this same servant refuses his request and throws the other man in jail. And when the master hears of this matter, he becomes infuriated and he tells the man, should you not have shown mercy on your fellow servant? as I shown mercy on you. So also, Jesus says, so also, my heavenly Father will do the very same thing to you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Francis would have us know that this parable contains a crucial teaching for us all. Mercy is not only an action of the Father. It becomes a criterion for discovering who his true children are. In short, we're called to show mercy because mercy has first been shown to us. Pardoning offenses, it's the clearest expression of merciful love. And for we who are Christians, it's an imperative from which we cannot excuse ourselves. Mercy as forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness happens in many places, doesn't just happen in the church's reconciliation room. Mercy as forgiveness happens when I decide that holding the hurt as my badge of honor is too high a price to continue paying. It's important to remember that forgiveness is neither natural, instinctive, logical, 
and usually it's very difficult. In fact, giving mercy frequently comes across as bizarre, ludicrous, weak, and even scandalous activity, so that it's often abandoned as an idea before it ever becomes a practice. So here are a few tips. It's not necessary to tell the person you're forgiving that he or she is subject of your efforts. If it helps, tell him. If it doesn't help, don't tell him. The same rule of thumb holds for true after forgiveness occurs. You have no obligation to tell the person you've forgiven that you've done so. Forgiveness is just as hard to receive as it is to give. In both cases, forgiving involves an owning of the person and a disowning of the offense. Mercy means what was done is forgiven for the sake of who did it. Mercy forgiveness is difficult to give because you need to see the one who hurt you as other than the hurt. Mercy forgiveness is difficult to receive because our need to believe that someone has seen more in you than whatever hurtful thing it is that you ever did. Even though the person who hurt you and is in need of your forgiveness is far away geographically or has even died, it's never too late or impossible to forgive. Mercy applies to the living and to the dead. And for some of us, that's crucial to know. Mercy has no geographic or time barriers. Being a person of mercy involves more than good thoughts. It involves activity, not passivity. So it is that St. Pope John Paul II, in his second encyclical, Dives in Misericordiae, said to the world, the present day mentality seems directly opposed to a God of mercy. Yet the church lives an authentic life when the church professes and proclaims mercy, the most stupendous attribute of the Creator and of the Redeemer. So in this year of mercy, the church's credibility lies in how the church shows mercy and compassionate love. With so many issues in the world, being a field hospital of mercy in the world is a crucial gift the church can bring. And so Pope Francis puts it this way, the church is commissioned to announce the mercy of God, the beating heart of the gospel. The spouse of Christ must pattern her behavior after the Son of God, who went out to everyone without exception. Father Ron Rollheiser, a spiritual writer and an insightful spiritual guide, tells us this story about that. Shortly after ordination and doing replacement work in a parish, I found myself in a rectory with a saintly old priest. He was over 80. He was nearly blind but he was widely sought out and respected, especially as a confessor. One night, alone with him, I asked him a question. If you'd had your priesthood to live over again, would you do anything different? From a man so full of integrity, I had fully expected there would be no regrets. So his answer surprised me. Yes, he did have a great regret, a major regret, he said. If I had my priesthood to do over again, I would be easier on people the next time. I wouldn't be so stingy with God's mercy, with the sacraments, with forgiveness. You see, what was drilled into me was the phrase, the truth will set you free. And I believe that it was my responsibility to challenge people so as to protect them and something inside of them. That's good, but I fear that I've been too hard on people. They have pain enough without me in the church laying further burdens on them. I should have risked 
mercy more. Grohlheiser said he was struck by this because less than a year before, as he took the final exams in the seminary, one of the priests examined him and gave him this warning. Be careful, the priest said. Never let your feelings get in the way. Don't be soft, that's wrong. Remember, hard as it is, only the truth will set people free. Sound advice, it would seem, for a young priest. However, as the years of his ministry moved toward middle age, Rollheiser felt more inclined to the old priest advice. We need to risk God's mercy more. This place of justice and truth should never be ignored, but we must risk letting the infinite, unbounded, unconditional, and undeserved mercy of God flow free. The mercy of God is as accessible as the nearest water tap. And so we, like Isaiah, must proclaim a mercy that has no price tag. Come. Come without money and without virtue. Come, everyone. Drink freely of the mercy of God. Pope Francis says it's absolutely essential for the church and for the credibility of her message that she herself live and testify to God's mercy justice. Her language and her gestures must transmit mercy justice so as to touch the heart of all people and inspire them once more to find the road that leads to the Father. We who are parents, ministers, teachers, catechists, elders, must risk proclaiming the prodigal character of God's mercy. We must not spend God's mercy as if it were ours to spend, dole out God's forgiveness as if it were a limited commodity, put conditions on God's love as if God were a political ideology, a cut-off access to God as if we were keepers of a heavenly gate. If we tie God's mercy to our own fear and lack of courage, we limit God's mercy to the size of our own minds. Pope Francis says in a stunning way, the aim of being church is to be servant to the love of Christ. Wherever there are Christians, everyone should find an oasis of mercy. Now, how would that affect the world in which we live today? If that quote was true, what kind of church would we have? What kind of neighborhoods would we live in? What kind of government could we expect? The Gospels tell us of the well-meaning apostles who tried to keep certain people away from Jesus as if those people were not worthy to be with him. So they tried to shoo away children and tax collectors, people with sexual sin, people who did not fit their mold. Jesus always overruled them. He said, let them come to me. Times have not changed that much. Well-meaning people still try to do the same thing. They try to keep people from God's mercy as it is expressed in the word, the sacrament, and in the church's common life. In this jubilee year, we Catholics are to live merciful like the Father. That's the program of life. We don't need to protect God. God desires that everyone, regardless of their condition, culture, age, readiness, or lack of it, comes to the font of God's own divine mercy. The words of the poet Denise Levertov will end our consideration today with part of her poem, To Live in the Mercy of God. To live in the mercy of God, to feel vibrate the enraptured waterfall, flinging itself unabating down and down to clenched fists of rock, swiftness of plunge, hour after year, after century. 
O and ah uninterrupted, voice many stranded, to breathe spray, the smoke of it, arcs of steel white foam, glissades of fugitive jade, barely perceptible, such passion, rage or joy, thus not mild, not temperate, God's love for the world, vast flood of mercy, flung on resistance. Oh.